a little bit about last night and also just give us some con context on a number of other issues. So with that, I'd like to bring up the student who will introduce our speaker, Ms. Lauren Summers, who is an entrepreneurship major and a graduating <laughs> senior entrepreneurship major. Thank you. It is a great honor to introduce Mr. Davenport. Mr. Davenport is a businessman and a lawyer. He was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. After earning his BS degree in economics from Pennsylvania State University in 1958, he went to law school earning his LMB degree from Temple University in 1962. He went to Yale School for his LMB degree in 1963. Mr. Davenport started his career in professional law in Duquesne University in 1963, where he remained for 20 years, where he took over the law school in 1970, being the dean. Davenport became the first black man to be the dean of a predominantly white university. In 1982, Davenport became a partner at the Buchanan Eagles Professional Corporation and the Fellow of the U.S. State Department reviewing legal systems in South Asia. I mean, I'm sorry, in South, South and in South and East Asia. Davenport also served as a consultant to the Constitutional Convention Preparatory Committee of Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania Constitution Convention. Mr. Davenport um, simply practiced law. In 1972, Davenport became the chairman of the Sheridan Broadcasting Corporation, a group of his wife and him formed from the purchase of four radio stations. By 1976, um, Sheridan Broadcasting owned half the multi-black networks, later completing the buyout. Sheridan Broadcasting was heard through more than 300 radio affiliations across the country. He also served as a co-chairman of the American Urban Radio Networks. Beyond his endeavors in the practice of law and broadcasting, Davenport gave his time widely wide variety of other organizations. Davenport also served on the board of the Collegiate University, was a chairman of visiting committee in African American Studies at Harvard. He also served on the board of Airmark. Davenport was awarded numerous honorary degrees the Man of the Year from the Masons, and also participated in several conferences with the U.S. President. I now introduce Mr. Davenport. I'm uh, particularly happy to be here, and again, thank you for the introduction. I came to my first visit to the South. When I was introduced, it was said that I was born in Philadelphia, and my parents never allowed me to go south. Now, my family was from South Carolina, but uh, they were concerned about uh, my attitudes. <laughs> and so uh, my, my first visit to, to the south was here in Jackson. It was, not, it was 1964. It was several weeks, well, a few days, really, after the kids turned up missing. And I, I came here uh, to head up the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund office and to work with Derek Bell uh, to uh, work to get Cleve McDowell, who had been kicked out of Ole Miss College for, for carrying a gun, which he sorely needed. <laughs> um, and we, we were in Meridian with Judge Sidney Mines uh, fighting to get uh, him back in school. That was my first visit uh, to, to the South and my first visit to Jackson. My second visit to Jackson came in 1966. I came here under the, the Department of Education to deal uh, with uh, school, de school desegregation. I walked every hill and mole hill <laughs> in Mississippi. Uh, I remember, not quite fondly, uh, going to Yazoo City. Uh, again, uh, a meeting with the school superintendent and the school board chair. The school board chair was a lawyer and he said, that he was offended by the fact that uh, the federal government, representing by yours truly, 
was telling him what that they should be what they should be doing with the schools in Yazoo City. He said his his brother had fought and died in the Second World War, and, and that he for the idea that they could pretty much do what they want. I said to him that well, I'm sure that there were some black soldiers from Yazoo City who fought and died in the Second World War. He said, Mr. Davenport. Um, you know, Yazoo City is, is a good place, and I'd love for you to, you to come back sometime. And I, I said to him, I would be happy to, to come back if I could come back with my wife as his guest. And that's the last I heard of it. <laughs> so that was my, my, my second visit to, to, the, uh, to Mississippi. In 1972, as was mentioned, my wife and I founded the Sheridan Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, which Sheridan, by the way, was named after the street on which we then lived, <laughs> Sheridan Avenue. We created uh, <clears throat> the Sheridan Black College All-American team. Now, I have my director of sports to, uh, do, do, a, do a review of, of, of those teams since, since that time, and would you believe it, 58 members of, of the teams over the years were from, were from Jackson State. So you highly and well represented. Uh, the creation of this all-American team. Now remember, I, I frankly attended all all white colleges, but I knew that uh, we had to learn to celebrate our own. And so the creation of this SBN, the Sheridan Broadcasting Network, Black College All-American Team, was to celebrate the accomplishments of black colleges and and their athletes. Now, this brings me to now my third involvement. Okay. We skip, skip ahead now from 1966 to 1981. With the Sheridan Black College All-American team, we would host, and we paid for everything. We'd bring uh, 24 athletes, uh, 22 athletes uh, and coaches uh, to whatever city where we planned to have the uh, dinner. Uh, really, it, it was a weekend. and. <laughs> Because it, it, it was, again, my belief that we had to pay for our own and, and celebrate our own. In 1981, it turned out that we were scheduled to be in Jackson, Mississippi. Okay? Now, prior to that time, there, there had been a, a number of uh, some people who tried to have black college, all-American, uh, part of the all-star game in New Orleans. And it was a spectacular failure. Uh, and they stuck a lot of people with their bills, and you know, they didn't pay the bill. So we're in Jackson, Mississippi, coming to Jackson, and folks came to me and they said, look, uh, we should do, since we're going to be there, uh, the All-Star Game. And by the way, the Jackson State Marching Band was the band that we used mm -hmm. in, in, in 1981. Do I that? <laughs> okay. Uh, and so we decided to, to, to do it. I mean, you know, I, I'm a child of the uh, 50, child of the civil rights movement, so of course, the idea of putting on uh, a, a black college all-star game in Jackson, Mississippi, in 1981 was just too important uh, to to turn down. Well, needless to say, <laughs> it was a spectacular failure. We had a, uh, we had some people there. We, we had a nice crowd. They have a nice enough to take care of the cost. Okay. We, uh, when we came down, just to show that, that uh, we were serious, we, we put $100,000 in the, in the local bank to, to make so people would know that all the bills would be paid. And remember, this is 1981, and $100,000 was a lot of money, a lot of money. Anyway, uh, as I said, at the time, we were getting, getting ready to, to buy a radio station in, in Atlanta. Uh, but we lost, I said, we, we lost on that game about $185,000, which was a ton of money. I told people at that time, I took an eight count. <laughs> an eight count. It was serious. But I dusted myself off and got up. And being, again, the child. Turn it up a little louder. Can you hear me better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, as I said, uh, we lost $185,000 on that game, and I took an eight count. But I, again, a child of the civil rights movement, I dusted myself off, got up, 
and said, well, we're coming back to Jackson, but we're not going to let Jackson uh, be this, okay? The Sheridan Broadcast Corporation. But, of course, I could not afford to run that kind of thing naturally. So I was on a couple of boards, and I got the boards to help me underwrite the second game. Well, at the second game, if you can believe it, the, the day of the game, there was an ice storm here in Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> We had 7,000 people in the stand, <laughs> and of course, it was a disaster. I said, the Lord's trying to tell me something here. <laughs> but what I didn't know about doing an all-star game, again, it's, it's this naive tale, uh, was that all-star games are supported, are supported um, by, by the businesses. They buy up the tickets and they pay for the stand. So it wasn't, it, wasn't uh, it, it was my fault in terms of having, a, in effect, a bad business model. I had the support at that time of, of Governor Bill Winter and Senator Thad Cochran because I had friends in politics and they called and, and said, Davenport's okay, <laughs> you, you can trust him. But it was still a failure, nonetheless. So that was my third. That was 1981 and 82. Uh, but I survived, <laughs> barely, but I survived. Now, as a child of the 50s, uh, my goal in life was to get out of uh, college, make a lot of money, retire at 50, buy a red MG and a baseball cap, and teach government at some small college, okay? But in the fall of my senior year in, high, in, in college, I started to talk, I took 11 job interviews and not one follow-up. And so I began to ask people, I said, do you hire Negroes? We were Negroes then. <laughs> do, you, do you hire Negroes for your man management training programs? And they said, no. And so I realized at that time that um, I, you know, I'd been told that I should be a lawyer, but I had frankly no desire to, to be a lawyer. Uh, but I realized that I wanted to have control over my life, over how I lived, and I wanted to be paid commensurate with my father as a, re a reflection of my talents. And so I decided to go to law school. Now, keep in mind, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And so here I am going to law school, and then graduate law school. My aunt says, we, 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 we got Ron in school, now we can't get him out. <laughs> OK. But anyway, uh, so how did I become a law professor? Well. So I'm finishing Yale Law School, and you know, I was fortunate to be a, a decent student, and um, I was a part of, a, of, the, of, of the, really the best black law firm in the country, in, in Philadelphia. But I realized that at that time, there were only 3,000 law professors you know, uh, in the country for all the law schools, and that if you became a law professor, it was prestigious, and frankly, it paid as well, <laughs> if not better, than being a practicing black lawyer. And so I decided to, yeah, and at that time, when, when I joined the law faculty at Duquesne in 1963, uh, I was the third black on the white faculty in the history of this country. The third. Now, in 1970, when, when I became dean, as was mentioned, excuse me, I was the first black uh, to be dean of a white law school in the history of this country. And my friend said, aren't you proud of it? So I said, no, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed for this country, because I'm not the smartest black lawyer that ever lived. All that means is that a lot of people were denied opportunity. Now, in 1964, we had the passage of the Voting Rights Act, okay? Pardon me, the Public Accommodation and Employment Discrimination Bill, so where is that? In 1965, we had the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Now, I, I always hesitated to, to say this because I knew this would be misconstrued by some people, so I, I wouldn't say it. But in all candor, the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Bill, which meant that now I could go to Miami Beach, uh, and the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that meant that I could go to Mississippi even though they didn't want me to, uh, that all the prohibitions on black advancement in this country have been removed. 
Let me repeat that. All prohibitions have been removed. When I was coming out of college, coming out of law school, there were prohibitions. There are things we could not do because we were black. But the, that is no longer the case. Now, to say that the prohibitions have been removed does not mean that there are not barriers still. There are huge barriers. You know, barriers of being a woman, barriers of being black, barriers of being a Catholic or Irish or Jewish or what have you, barriers of being poor and, and not having the resources that you need. But there are no prohibitions. Repeat that. And I think for, for you, you, you students there, you keep that in mind, there are no prohibitions. What you must do, though, is be ruthless in the analysis of your skills and talents. Not what you like to do. Not how you, because as I said, I wanted to teach government at a small college. That was not an opportunity that was available to me. So I played the hand that I had. And you must play the hand that you have consistent with the skills and the talents that you think you bring to bear. And you must be, I say, I say ruthless. I'm, I'm going to talk about in terms of relationship to other people. I'm talking about in terms of your analysis of your skills, how you can succeed. I, I always say that if you're, if you're five foot ten, you don't jump seven. You don't jump seven. You have to learn how to handle the ball. Okay? So we as a people are now a part of the game. We're presidents, governors, investment bankers. I mean, my, my daughter's an investment banker on, on Wall Street. The, the Dr. Holden, Mrs. Holden's goddaughter, <laughs> a godchild, <clears throat> and for 10 years making obscene amounts of money. Uh, obscene, uh, I, I, I couldn't believe it. But we're in that game now. You know, they're, they're, they have a coterie, she and her husband, are friends who are doing incredibly well. You know, you know I, I used to say to all the people when we were coming along, and when they say they thought the white folks were superior, I said, if you think white folks are superior, it's because you never work with them. <laughs> if you work with, you know better. Okay? Now, <clears throat> this brings me to my, my next observation, really on uh, the power of, let's say, on, on power, authority, and race. Okay? Power, I'm, I'm going to read this so I don't mess it up. Okay? <clears throat> power is neutral. Unfortunately, the concept of power has been viewed in a pejorative sense. That is, we think of power as the ability to, to, con to control someone, to tell him or her what to do. We think of the power in, in the military sense, that is an army, who has the bigger army, the most rockets or the most guns. What I wish to discuss here is, is power in the civil sense of the word. That is the opportunity to sit at the table where decisions are made. Every institution has institutional rules. I would suggest to those of you who are here, committed to making the world a better place, you must first understand how your institution is governed and organized. Whether it is a law firm, university, governmental agency, or private business, you must understand the, that how the decisions are made and who makes the decisions and how one gets to be a decision maker. Too often, that we, that is black folks, spend a lot of time attacking how the decisions are made within the institution and the credentials that one needs to be successful within that institution in terms of their relevancy to, to job performance. It is extremely difficult to change institutional decision making if one does not have the credentials and success within that institution to, to give you power and authority. I have two examples. As a fellow came to a university to, 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 to be dean uh, of uh, one, one of the departments, uh, division uh, He and the president chose him because he was a Rhodes Scholar. This fellow had no particular academic distinction, and the president did not give him increased resources uh, so that he, he could bribe his faculty members. So I told uh, his associate, Dave, who was a friend of mine, I said, he's going to fail. He doesn't have the credibility in terms of his own prestige to persuade people to, to follow his leadership. 
and he doesn't have the resources to bribe him. And he will fail. And he did. There's a, a, another law school. There was a fellow uh, who was a, 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 really a first-rate scholar, who, but and then they made him dean of a law school, but he did not have a law degree. He had not gone to law school. He was never accepted. He had never walked the, the halls of, of, of the law business. And so it did not work. You must be, you must be a part of whatever institution you're in. You must understand it, its interstices, uh, how it moves and functions. Then you can influence it. Okay. So, uh, and but again, this has nothing to do with race or color or sex. Okay. There are sometimes you, you, you need credential. If you need a, a credential in, in, in my business, back when I was uh, an academic, you have to have a degree from an Ivy League institution if you wanted to be a dean. Okay. And you had to have a certain class rank if you wanted to teach. Now, you might be brilliant and very smart, but you would never get the opportunity to play if you did not have the credentials. I'm not suggesting that that's right. There are a lot of smart people, very smart people coming right out of Jackson State, a lot smarter than people coming out of Yale. But if you don't have the credentials, you're not going to get, be allowed to, to play in the game. So if you come out of Jackson State, and, and you, then you go to Harvard, you go to Yale, then you are adopted. You, you become one of the team, so to speak. Now, not really, but at least you can play the game. <laughs> you see? And you understand better, because you sat in, in the classroom with, with, with your colleagues, better how they function and their, their skills and, and their tactics were found. Now, I mentioned uh, not that I was very much actively involved in, in the civil rights movement. And it was a heavy time. I was writing briefs for the Supreme Court, going to the Supreme Court, watching my cases all I did. I was, I was active here in, in Jackson, Mississippi. You know, and, uh, and I loved it. But I never wanted to be thought of as a civil rights lawyer. I wanted to, you know, if, and I don't know if the, the younger ones, you understand this fully. But in, in the circus uh, parlance, there's a big top where all the main acts are played. Okay. And then there are the side shows, the, the, the small acts. And I said, I wanted to play under the big top. I wanted to be a player where it counted, where the resources were the greatest and, and the uh, payoff was the greatest. I never considered myself a black law professor. I said I was a law professor who was black. I had colleagues, I went to work for legal defense firms, but I, I encouraged to, to come to join the law faculty. But some of them kept saying, well, so-and-so institution needs a black professor. I said, no, they don't need a black, they, they need a professor who's black. Because if you're hired as a, quote, black professor, then they want you, what they want you then to do in these white institutions is to babysit black kids rather than doing your job, okay? And you will be judged in the final analysis about how, how well you do your job within the, the terms of the standards of that particular institution, okay? Now, in 2007, uh, my wife, we, we, we have a house on Martha's and Jen. And in 2007, we were approached to do a fundraiser for a young senator who was running for president of the United States. The ratings were bad. People thought he was going nowhere. It was easy for us to, to, to say yes because uh, my son had, was a classmate of his wife at Harvard Law School. So we decided to do the fundraiser. So we invited a number of people, black and white, and we raised a lot, okay. over $300,000. And uh, before the fundraiser, a friend of mine from uh, New York City uh, stopped me. And he was, this is a very distinguished uh, fellow, white male. And he says, he says, Ron, do you think that a black man can be elected 
President of the United States? And I said, no. Okay. I said, but a man who is black can be. Let me repeat that. A man who is black can be. And we've seen that uh, uh, play out in this country. You see, uh, not that they're not racist, not that they're not people who, who will, quote, try to keep you in your place, so forth and so on. But fundamentally, fundamentally, if you present yourself in a certain way, if you present yourself as a major player, and you have the talent to back it up, you will be treated as a player. No matter what your color, no matter what your sex, no, no matter what your, your uh, race, it does not matter. I mean, I'm not saying that they're, 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 uh, they won't, again, be barriers. When I taught, I used to tell the, my students that whatever can be used against you will be. You're too tall, you're too short, you're too fat, you're too skinny, uh, you're, you know, uh, you're not quite as articulate, of course, because in the game of power, that's what happens. If there is a weak point, it will be attacked, and will be attacked viciously. But that comes with the game. If you're going to be a power player, you have to understand what happened. What happened. In my generation, uh, there, there was an investigation of uh, people who joined organizations because of their, their, their this concern about communist background. So my generation, we've been very, very careful about what organizations we join. Because we don't want to be, be in front of some Senate committee saying, you know, did you belong to X, Y, or Z organization and having to really deep, 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 deep defend that. Now, I said, there are all, all kinds of barriers that we have, but uh, we must first understand the people with whom we are dealing. They're, what they find important. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas says, if you are to convince a man of the correctness of your view, you must first go to where he is and bring him to you. You must first understand where he lives and he, what he feels and bring him to you. The, the, uh, over the last 40 years, black males as a group and white females as a group have done well. W the white male working class has not, which would understand, which would explain rather, why uh, the president would have difficulty in dealing with the white working class. Again, I'm not trying to um, defend how they feel or what they feel or what they are about. I'm just saying that we must understand their insecurities, their concerns. When I was president of the Urban League in Pittsburgh, we we're, were doing school desegregation, and uh, the, the parents responded, uh, by having a massive demonstration against uh, uh, kids being bus. And I told my, my friends, I said, some of those people walking around there, around the, the city hall, are, are racist. I said, but most of them are just concerned parents. And we have to be, we have to deal with the reality of their fear. You, you won't remember, but in Boston, there's a woman by the name of, of Louisa Day Hicks, who was thought of as being the biggest racist in the world, dealing with the question of school desegregation. And it, um, uh, Teddy Kennedy and the other uh, leaders there were, were talking about how bad this, this woman was. But they were sending their kids to private schools. And as, as a, an Italian friend of mine, friend who taught me, he said, Ron, if integration is so good, why isn't it, it good for, for their kids, too? So the, the issue is, again, I'm not talking about what's right and what's wrong in this, or making value judgment, but in understanding how this country works and understanding how people are. We must first up go to where they are 
and then bring them to us. Now, the last thing I, I, I really want to talk about in one sense, because all of you here are privileged. You, know, you might not think of yourself as privileged, but, but you are. I told my, my mother once that, uh, that I was born a wealthy man. And she said, well, what? We lived in a public housing project before. I said, if you're born with love in your house, you are wealthy. If you're born without love, you are impoverished for life, no matter what you have in your resources. Okay. Now, I said that we are privileged. And I grew up in, in, in a public housing project in Philadelphia. Uh, Cosby and I grew up together. We have, though, an underclass problem that we as a people have to face. White folks are not going to solve it for us. We have to solve it. We have 15 year olds having babies, 14 year olds. We have an underclass that replicates itself every 15 years, while, while, while people like yourselves do so every 30 or 35. And the underclass replicates itself and has four or five children, and you replicate yourselves and you have two or three. We have to address that. Now, if you ask me if I know the answer, no. Uh, I have thoughts, of course. But clearly, we will not be totally free as a people until we address that. And again, I'm not trying to find fault with, 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 with that underclass group. This is, I'm just saying that is a reality which we must face. Now, a friend of mine said to me, um, I mean, I, I, I think, the question was asked, well, this is a great time for, for, for black folks, that we are, we are exposed to all levels of power. We have all levels of power. We have all kinds of, of opportunities. And even with the underclass problem, a friend of mine said, well, you know, uh, Ron, uh, Darwin wins, that is, the survival of the fittest. And I said, I agree. I believe in Darwin. Because God, in his infinite wisdom, has given talent to blacks, whites, male, female, or whatever your background. And with the, the only difference was, up until recently, we were not allowed in the game. So if Darwin is the game, we can play. If, you know, going back now to Jackson State and football, you know, you had one of your uh, graduates, Bob Brazil, who was the first middle linebacker, all pro, okay? Because folks said black cannot play that position. You had to have the instincts of an assassin. And of course, you know, since we're like, we, we love to dance, we obviously don't have that kind of <laughs> so, But Bob Brazil disproved that. In other words, once we got in the game, we, we can play. And that's why I'm optimistic about your future. Because you're in the game. The only limitations that you have are the limitations that you place on yourself. Now, I had mentioned earlier that I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And so therefore, I had no daddy or mommy to tell me how to play this game, or what I should do. But I can tell you, everything you need to know, everything you need to know is in a book. Everything. And, I, I, and, I'm, I, and I'm, I'm not talking about necessarily a textbook. It, it, might, it might be fiction. I mean, I didn't know you had to work hard in law school, but I read the, the, a, a book about a guy going to the University of Pennsylvania and how hard he worked. And then I had a classmate of mine say, Ron, it's not how much you have up here, but back here. That is, how much butt time are you going to put in to, to master the material? And so, regardless of your support system in, in, in the sense of having you know, mommy or daddy to take what to do, everything you need to know is in a book. And I'd say to you finally that the only limitation that you have are the limitations that you place on yourself. In my generation, the best thing you, you, you could be was a doctor. But some people, in terms of uh, your ecologists, but some people were not good in chemistry. So why would they go to med school? Or the department, they couldn't get into med school. 
you have to play the hand that goes to your skills and talent. And if you do so, there can be no question of your success. Thank you very much. with the Department of Mass Communications. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, um, what inspired you and your wife to um, found a, a broadcasting company? Green. <laughs> Green. <laughs> <laughs> what were you for, thinking? <laughs> for, yeah. uh, because, you know, my generation, again, I, I, I say I'm from the Jack, Jackie Robinson, I'm younger, but mm -hmm. from the Jackie Robinson generation, we were not allowed again. Uh, and I believed that uh, we, we have been spent time in Mississippi, have been spent time in walking these hills and molehills. hills. Uh, I believe that we have to own the piece of the economy. And, and I, I have it in my written remarks, I didn't mention it, but when we found the shared broadcasting, there are no special programs, there are no set aside, there are no minority investment thing. You know, the, uh, when, when the bank gave us a million and a half dollars to go into a business about we, were, uh, we didn't know a thing about, and that in which we were only going to work part time. They, the banks started getting calls from, from all over the country about their, they, did they have a quote, minority lending program? They said, no, we just want, we want the money to Ron and Judy. I mean, <laughs> and now why, 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 why was that? Again, going back to my big top sideshow comment, if you present yourself as a big top player, you will be treated as a big top player. There will, there will always be people trying to push you to the side show. It's like you're going to the, this election, you know, all, all the dog whistles in terms of uh, uh, the, the president and, and uh, the people talking about trying to get him to respond in the racial way. That's, put, that's pushing you to the side show. It's put, if, you, if you are focused, you're focused on being, a big top, uh, being uh, under the big top, but you, ha you have to pay big, uh, big top dues. You know, a friend of mine, and I'll, I'll leave the college I mentioned, where there are people, it was a fine college, but uh, he gave, this is several years ago, he, he gave $1,500, this guy was a social worker, so he was not a doctor or a lawyer or something, for his college, for their fundraising, and he was one of the top givers. You know, the point is that we have people, but as a people, we're so accustomed to being the objects of charity rather than sacrificing ourselves. When, when, we, when my wife and I did fundraising in, uh, for people running for office, the first dollars on the table was what we put out. What we put out. Then if, if I'm putting up a hundred dollars, you know, a hundred dollars, maybe you can't put up a hundred dollars. You can only put up 25. But I said, I got a hundred in here. And, and that, that sets, sets the standard. So the point, again, it's all about how you want to position yourself. You, you, you position yourself. No one else does. Yes, sir. Hi, everyone, sir. My name is Ross Walker. I'm a senior account major at Jackson State. Um, with this past election, one of the big issues were convicted felons and the right to vote. By you being a lawyer and everything, I was wondering what is your view on convicted felons and voting and them getting out, getting their education, and being positive community but still having that stigma on their record of having to say that they're a convicted felon. I think it's awful. But one of the things though, I think you have to make a decision, okay, in terms of how you spend your time and your resources, intellectual and personal. There are a lot of problems. There are a lot of wrong things. There are a lot of people being treated unfairly. But you have to focus on what you can influence, because otherwise you'll be very frustrated. Again, I think I think it's awful. I think our, our drug laws are are, are, are awful. You know, uh, but a long time ago, I, I, I felt this is 
give our treasure away, I felt overwhelmed by the, the enormity of the problems of, uh, of black folks. And then I said, no, I'm going to focus on my farm. I'm going to grow as much as I can on my farm. Uh, feed as many people as I can from, from my farm. And maybe the guy or person at the farm next to mine will say, you know, Ron's doing all right. Maybe I should try what he's doing. In other words, leading by example. You, you know, and it, again, th there are people uh, who should uh, focus on the problem that you, you've outlined. And you might be one of them. But you have to make that, that decision because no matter how talented you are, you can't do everything. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, I'm Stanford. My name is Eric Stringfellow. I work in uh, University of Communications. And uh, first, I want to thank you. Uh, I played football here at Jackson State from 1978 to 1982. And uh, I was at the 1981 game. <laughs> One of my teammates, Tom Rice, Jerry Rice's older brother, played right. in that game. Right. 1982 game, uh, Keith Taylor, my classmate, wow. teammate, who was a quarterback, played it. Was a quarterback for one of the teams. And well, thank you for that, and also just for you know, we Sheraton, the Sheraton Broadcasting Co. gave us legitimacy as, as, as football players. Man. It was published in the paper. We looked at it every week. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for that as well. Uh, my question to you is, uh, when you look at uh, uh, football, athletics in general, at HBCUs today, uh, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on whether or not there's a national market for HBCU football and athletics. And uh, say that because, I mean, <laughs> the TV split for the SEC last year was $18 million per team, okay? And uh, I'm not saying that we ought to get $18 million for swag schools, but just in proportion, I mean, how do we, how do, we do that? Leverage. In, in, in other words, uh, you start up, we have to, to support our own. It, it, I mean, too often we're, we're going out looking for handouts from these folks. And, you know, and they'll give you handouts, you know, nothing. <laughs> um, it is not, I mean, not nothing serious. But the schools, and first of all, it, 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 in contrast when I was just coming out of school, I mean, you know, black college, black college spreads can play. Now, a lot of them are going to, to, to you know, Alabama or wherever, and that's to be expected. That's to be expected. But it's a question of banding together, banding together, marketing what you have. And the thing is, you, there's an enormous uh, alumni re re relationships uh, from, from the HBCUs. You know, I'm a graduate of Penn State, right? Now, Penn State, uh, you know, with all, with all the problems of past too. Uh, but the uh, people who love Penn State, I mean, talking about the, not, people, not necessarily the, the grads, people love Penn State because the supporters travel. They spend money. The people watch it on TV. And I, you know, every game, and with all the Penn State problems, with all the, you know, the, the uh, notoriety it's, it's had last year, it's, it's been on television every weekend this season. Now why? You know, you know Penn State has, a, has such a squeaky clean reputation, uh, but it, they, it's on television because people watch it. That's why. Because the alumni association, the, the alumni watch it and they go to the games. So the, the HBCUs, you know, uh, uh, I was on the National Board of Urban League, and this is in the, in, in the, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, and they're saying, quote, this, uh, a woman, a white fellow from Louisiana says, do we need black colleges? And this is an Urban League, Urban League uh, board member, good liberal guy. And I, and I, I said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I said, of course we need black colleges. Of course we need black colleges where people have a chance to grow and to, to be uh, with their own and to learn uh, from, from each other. I think black colleges are incredibly important, but the game has changed. And the point is, <clears throat> right now, HBC has access to power, it leverage. 
Well, what has, you know, another part of my speech I did, which I didn't mention, was well, what, you know, what, what has the president done for black folks? His presence changes the game. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a fast story. So we're at the inaugural in, in 2009, and this woman who was a lawyer from Hollywood, okay, and uh, she got a call from, from her boss. We're at the, at the hotel in Washington. It's a black woman. And they said, uh, uh, where are you? She says, well, I'm here in Washington for the inaugural. He says, what are you doing there? <laughs> she says, I just had breakfast with my college classmate, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> that changed it. Now, it wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> but what? Wow. It could have been. It, it could have been. You know, and, and so it, it's, a, it's a question of understanding the leverage that you have. You know, uh, I, there are lots of things I, 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 I can tell you there. You know, and, and it's, it's all there. I mean, you, you have the HBCUs, you start you know, with, uh, you have a great student body. You have, I mean, most of our graduates, uh, black folks who went to college went to HBCUs. I mean, not the Penn State. So it's all there. It's all there. It's a question of harnessing it. Stepping at, at back, giving the people organized first of all, to, uh, having a common vision, and then, you know, the first, as I said, you go into your own pocket. You, know, you, you, you can't say, what are they going to give us? Because they're not going to give anything that that counts. If you want it, you got to take it. If you want it, you got to demand it. You know, uh, in the 60s and 70s, when I was doing a lot of speaking, because I, I don't, I, Dr. Holden prevailed upon me to someone to come here, because I don't give uh, speeches anymore. I've, I've done it. But back when I was doing that, they, they, they'd say, uh, uh, Dean Davenport, uh, what do you charge? I said, I don't charge. No, we want to pay you. I said, if I charge you what I think I'm worth, you can't afford me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd rather do it for free. I'm not going to do it for $50. I mean, I, I can use it for $50. But no, but I'm not going to price myself. Again, it's being what? Under the big top, playing in the real game. And, and understanding what you bring to the table. So I, I think HBCUs have, have a great opportunity. We have people now in places of power. I mean, we have people now that you can lean on who are making, <coughs> making serious money. I talked about my daughter on Wall Street making obscene amounts of money. You know, and there are a lot of HBCUs who are up there, but they have to understand their responsibility. That they have to pay. And they have to put the money back where they came from. Again, and, and, you know, uh, when I got back from, from, from Jackson in 64, and I was you know, with some people on, on the beach in Atlanta City, and they said, Ron, why were you down there helping those people? I'm, these are black folks I talk about. I said, I'm, not, I'm there to help me. <laughs> <laughs> because if they're not free, what? Well, I'm not free. So I, I, think, I, think, I think you have a good opportunity. Just this question of pressing the, pressing the button. The buttons are there. The buttons are there. Okay. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Davenport? Now at this time, I'd like to invite the man for whom the lecture series is named Dr. Matthew Holden. He has graciously agreed to provide some brief comments. He told me that uh, I was putting him on the spot, but I don't see how we can have this <laughs> opportunity and not invite Dr. Holden to provide some remarks. Dr. Holden. Dr. Mosley, thank you. It does put me on the spot to have to follow Ron Davenport. Um, I have two ways of, uh, of dealing with it. Uh, I can say more, I can tell the truth, or I can turn in some other direction. Uh, but I'm not going to do any of those. Let me make a couple of them. Uh, first, uh, I very much appreciate it. Ron says that I leaned on him to get him to come. Uh, that may be true. 
Uh, I will have to tell you, however, that um, we talked about this. I sensed some reluctance, or he said, and I said, "Well, um, uh, uh, we're on the telephone." I said, "Well, I'll talk a little. We'll talk later." Uh, I said, "But uh, I want to know." Uh, he said, "Yeah, we'll talk later." I said, "I want to come back." and said, "My point will be to get you to agree to come." He said, "Oh, well, I've already agreed." So we didn't talk later. Uh, so I don't know how much leaning I did, uh, but even so, uh, we have we've had a friendship that's gone back a good many years. Uh, he didn't say say that one of uh, their children is our godchild. Um, let me say something to put in the context of these remarks. One very important thing that Ron has said this morning. He said that the world of prohibitions that was his, and since we are nearly the same age, I have a few years on him, that world was also mine, except that I was born in Mississippi. And like many thousands of people, I moved north, stayed many years, and have a Mississippi connection today. That world of prohibitions is gone. I must emphasize that because I keep learning things about Jackson and Jackson State in years past. <coughs> and the prohibitions that existed for such things as Jackson College students, and whether they could simply walk freely to downtown or not without being in fear of the law. That kind of prohibition you obviously know is no longer there. The world of prohibitions may be gone. Barriers are another matter. And I say that, let me say a word then about the donation that Mrs. Holden and I made of what had been our extensive library. Uh, we needed to make a donation. Jackson State was pleased uh, and gracious to accept it. Dr. Mary Coleman was the person with whom we worked. But it, there is a concept there as well. The concept there is enabling Jackson State to become what it is not and where there are many barriers. Jackson State has not yet attained its potentiality of being not only the biggest HBCU in this region, but a major academic institutional player, both economic and intellectual, in the country and connected to the rest of the academic community. I wish to emphasize that. That is, one of the <coughs> part of the tasks is that you who are students here, some of you are faculty here, some of you are alumni have the task of getting out of the entirely local us focus so as not to employ fully the resource that is involved in that massive library on the other side of the campus and in which the Holden <coughs> collection is a little piece of it. And the way of thinking into the whole rest of the world you can't make a claim of being a player unless you understand something of the world into which you wish to move. And that is terribly, terribly important. And I want just to make that point only. Now let me say something else. We are here in Jackson, and I do not tread as lightly as I used to when I first came to live in Jackson, but I still tread lightly. The, the, this is a black majority city, by far. The question of whether or not the people have made their choices, their separate choices, as to how to develop the resources that already are present to make this city both a place in which people would wish to be and a political unit that has leverage in a legislature that comes to sit in this city. 
let me go a little beyond that to say there's a very interesting problem for everybody here who's connected with Jackson, Jackson State, and Mississippi. Mississippi is a very interesting place. I hope we have gotten beyond the point, I know we have not, but I hope we've gotten beyond the point of allowing Mississippi to be merely a joke on the one hand or an excuse on the other for not achieving. That is to say, where one says, oh, well, that's Mississippi and these people won't do. That doesn't cut it. Because we are here in a state that has separated itself from the rest of the country. If you look at what happened in the 2012 election, not 2008, a state that separated itself from the rest of the country and the resources that, that come politically for people here involve going somehow through that state. I do not know what the answer to that is, but I would charge the students and teachers of political science, both those who are present and those who are absent, those who have been here before but who have connections outside, and those who are yet to come. What is the means by which you are an, a minority, African-American principally, in a state that is a minority, that is, white, hardcore white Republican, in a country that obviously is very different from white, hardcore Republican. What is the way by which this population, this community, our population, our community, have some leverage for a constructive future? And that means thinking about what a constructive future would be. The chance to go back and look at the website and connect today's talk by my friend Mr. Davenport to the previous talk. Because a part of the task is connecting Jackson State to the University of California. Last year's speaker, Henry Brady, was the recent president of the American Political Science Association, the dean of the School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. And one of the things that is extremely important is that there should be a continuous flow between Jackson State on the one hand and Cal Berkeley on the other, which is where public policy students come and go. You go back to uh, uh, two or three lectures ago, and one of the lectures was Glenn Lowry. And connect Glenn Lowry's critique of Barack Obama as president with the Obama administration as it has existed and to think about the Obama administration as it will now emerge. Uh, and each of those, the, the series of today's talk is a capstone on those talks. And then there will be other times. And I hope that somehow that will be worth it and that you and I will learn how to make use of that. And that is for the moment my response that I give way to, I believe, the pros who follow me. <coughs> Oh, Mr. Ori is here. <laughs> and I wondered where you were, my friend. And we've established a collaboration with Cal Irvine, and I have a phone call with Cal Riverside at 1.30. Does everybody here understand what you're talking about? So we have about? students. We have students that will... No, does everybody here understand what you're talking about? I'm going to tell them. We have students that will actually be doing summer fellowships at the University of California, Irvine, um, coming this summer. Well, well they'll make some money. All right. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be uh, brief in my commentary. I'd be remiss to, as a political science if I didn't say how uh, delighted uh, I am to be here and to be a part of this marvelous activity. I also am delighted that we are filming this. And so the exposure of this conversation can go beyond this room. And that's something that's, that's critically important. Uh, Dr. Holden, your remarks remind me of the political science association meetings when you would have all of us there and we would listen to your wise counsel and so I'm delighted that, that you have this wonderful relationship with Jackson State. I just want to make um, a couple of, one fundamental observation about uh, Mr. Davenport's uh, remarks. Uh, actually early in my career I was a 
a buddy, a jazz DJ. And so we would get the Sheridan Broadcasting Report uh, through the wire. And so it, it, it's alive and forming this morning. Um, I'm reminded of the, the comment that Mr. Davenport made regarding it's all in a book. And especially for the students, um, and having this marvelous library and this internet access, it truly is all in a book. But as I reflected, on the life of Mr. Davenport and his wife, it seems like they had this ingenious way to blend intellect and action. Mm -hmm. If you think about the career that you just were exposed to, it seems as though they had multiple careers from investment, to civil rights, to academic leadership, to entrepreneurialism, to concern for HBCUs, for concern for whole communities, the Urban League. And I think for me, as I listened to the presentation, that was what was so compelling, that the knowledge gained through a disciplined life can provide a glorious opportunity to make a contribution beyond oneself. And that's what's so marvelous about the presentation. Because as we listen closely, you think about all of those life events. Many of those events were pioneering events, like the first time. I mean, how many first times can you have? I mean, he's a, there have been serial first timers. But the key, the base, was always knowledge and education. But it was education that was acted on. And that's what I think we can all learn from this wonderful presentation. The marvelous blending of intellect and action. It's very, very, very impressive and we all have learned a lesson from it. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, I also want to extend my appreciation to the Department of Mass Comm, who is, a, uh, Department of Mass Communications, I'm sorry, shorthanding it there. <laughs> Um, who is filming this lecture, as well as uh, our representative from the Center for University Scholars. Our web address is very simple. It's jsums.edu slash scholars. And on there you will find a, num a, a, a tremendous amount of insight and content relative to the past lectures. And you will find links to the digitization of Dr. and Mrs. Holden's collection. So you can also access aspects of the collection online as well. So with that, thank you for coming, and this concludes this year's lecture series. Right. Can y'all grab the bag from me and put this tripod away from me? Mm -hmm. Not just to you. Yeah. It's unfair, you know. You see, what happens is that you know, black folks think that 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 whites have all these opportunities. They don't. Right. <laughs> the right. Certain right. class of whites so have right. a, have yeah. opportunity, I mean, but if you, if you talk to the ethnics, it is, mm -hmm. just, so don't, don't worry about what's, what's. I understand your your idealism, because <laughs> I'm an idealist <laughs> my, my, myself. But the point is, you have to accept the fact that uh, you have to do what you think, what you enjoy, mm -hmm. because you if, if you're good at it, 
you'll, you'll be successful. Yeah. No, no, what that is. And don't worry about it. And my, our, 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 our daughter well, can our college. Her all her of her friends are going to business school and law school. One daughter. And, and, and I, she said, Dad, do you think I should go to law school? I said, of course not. <laughs> and she said, she'll tell you to this day, she's a TV producer. Yeah, she'll me. tell you to this day, yeah. thank God we didn't tell her to go to law school because she would have and she would have hated it. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't her. Okay. Now she's in, she's in the arts. Which she's is in a, the arts, which is completely very, different. Very difficult, you know. I mean, you try, but she's talented and All she's right. good at it. And so she's doing, doing fine. She had her. Okay. okay. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I really, really enjoyed that. We got a mm -hmm. that was great. Uh, it was uh, when Dr. Rennie told me he's going to be here. I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. you were there. They must know today. Oh, God. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, yeah, the second game, we had, you know, the sun was on one side of the stadium, so it moved. Everybody moved to the other side. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. oh, I took a, we took a beam. But yeah, hey, what can we say? Yeah, but, well, but, but that was my fault. See, it wasn't the city's fault. It was my fault. I, I, I had a bad business model, you know? I didn't fully understand how, I just wanted to show these white folks, see? By putting on this game, I was, you know. Well, we did, we showed them we could lose a lot of money. <laughs> 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 Can you get a picture with us? Yeah. Yeah, I want a picture with Mrs. Davenport in it. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Okay. Let's keep in touch. Let's do that. Where's, where, where's Walker? You know? Robert Walker. Uh, no, you don't. Yeah, yeah well, no, he's still in town. I'm still in, I'm still in the football game. You got lights. Okay, uh, Saturday. Okay. All right. You need a message? You need to talk to him? Well, I, I, I do. I do. Okay. Look this way, please. Right. I will make sure he finds out. All right. One, two, three. If you can, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.